get a ring in my ear which tells me we're starting recording. Uh, Misha Casanova, welcome to Lockdown Sessions. You are an executive coach, startup mentor, and you and I have known each other for like six or seven years when we met in Bruno. I think it was back to 2012. So okay, eight years. Now time flies. Well, okay. <laughs> Um, my first memory of, of uh, meeting you was uh, drinking Slivovica and Borovicka with you in a bar in uh, Bruno at the end of a work day. <laughs> and you telling me all about your house in the country that you would take your teams to as part of a way of breaking them down into thinking about purpose. And it was in that moment I knew you would make a great leader. So it's just fantastic that eight years later we find ourselves sitting, talking, in a lockdown session podcast. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing. <laughs> I remember that you even highlighted to me that you were in the dangerous because you have a memory of, a, of an elephant and that whatever I tell you, you will <laughs> remember it. You didn't uh, threaten me and it said you will use it against me. <laughs> but yeah, whenever Slivovice is involved, that's always a call for trouble. <laughs> but yeah, uh, no, I'm, I'm thrilled and excited to talk to you because uh, I remember when I first met you, I go like, wow, this is like a teacher. Like I was learning, I was paying attention every single moment of uh, the, the whole day, just observing you working with the audience. It was remarkable. And so I'm really excited that now I can work with you. Yeah, and, no, um, I, I think that's the fun bit, right? And, and you work in a world of coaching, you work in a world of leadership. And so what I'm really interested in this conversation is to try and understand a little bit from you. We've been in lockdown for like 100 plus days across Europe. Um, what have you as a coach been noticing and observing in yourself with some of your clients in your conversations that maybe people who are listening, you know, it would resonate for them because I'm positive you would have seen a lot of changes occurring and attitudes flying in at you in conversation. So what have you observed? What, what are you noticing? It's a long time, isn't it? Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whole new world. Um, so much change. I've been noticing a lot of shock. I think that was, that was for starters. Uh, a lot of denial. Uh, we've been discussing the uh, change curve right. uh, before we started. So, yeah, I've been looking at all the stages, the frustration, the depression. Uh, and now even some people are on the acceptance uh, back to integration, working in the brand new normal, uh, kind of like, yeah, whatever is the new norm and uh, we'll see how it goes and nothing really changes. And that brings a whole set of new frustrations around people because not everyone moves on the curve in the same pace. Not everyone would make it visible that they are suffering. They would, you know, especially in leadership roles, you want to lead your crowd and be positive and cheerlead your team. And when your team is grieving or is still in denial, they go like, can I allow myself to feel these feelings when my boss is already like laser focused on what needs done so that we survive? And so it was really a, a mixed bag of anxiety, stress, grief. Um, some people were losing their colleagues. Um, I was working with leaders who were on a lockdown who live on their own. So things like lack of physical proximity to someone, like no handshake, not to speak of, of a hug. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, yeah. I think it's, uh, I've definitely missed physically hugging people, for sure. 
actually with a number of my clients, because I've worked for many years with them, it was beyond handshakes anyway. When I saw them, it would be a, a hug. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I've missed, I, I know I've missed that uh, for sure. Uh, seeing a friend for the first time in four months, a colleague who works with me here at, at CTG. We went for a walk with the dogs last Sunday. And it took, like, it took real control not to lean into each other, right? We're actually yeah. consciously, yes, we're stepping back a little bit. And no, you, you stay there, I'll, I'll stay here. But you know, when you talk about leaders in that way, especially those that were like losing their team members. Uh, for me, the thing that I noticed in that moment was it was so quick. You know, literally here in the UK, 22nd of March, an email went out to nearly every business. From tomorrow, you're at home. And that, and that was it. If you were in a senior position, you probably already had a heads up, right, the week before, because the governments were changing things, we were reducing time we were trying to get people set up at home and I'm thinking to myself you know you've worked in the tech industry where so much of a lot of tech guys actually are quite comfortable working on their own actually it's not social distancing isn't a big deal <laughs> for them um, and I said with a smile but from a leadership point of view when you work in a world of collaboration and innovation where it's about sharing ideas how do you move leaders from that anxious suddenness to actually getting things done? Because you talked before about, you know, people were anxious and a bit frightened and leaders with a laser focus. How do you help move people quickly to kind of adopt a more can-do attitude than, you know, dealing with the shock? Because they did, they had to get on with it. I do a lot of physical uh, stuff because uh, you know better than I do that it all starts with the physiology, the focus and the language, what you focus on. Those are the big three that really, really affect you. And so I could talk about time management techniques and one big thing and uh, stuff like that, which I'm a big fan of. That, like one big thing would be my first go-to technique if someone is struggling with uh, lack of focus or with uh, uh, thinking about how do I lead my team, what do I do first, like there's so much to do, how do I prioritize? Uh, so I'm a big fan of uh, one big thing where you just plan for one thing that if you progress enough or complete, you will call it a day in that this was a productive day. Everything else that you do is an extra. It's a bonus. Mm -hmm. Like you only go on if you feel like doing it. If you don't, you just take a break. You go read a book, you just lay down, you do yoga, you do whatever you feel like doing. Uh, but before I could go there with uh, leaders who were struggling with their own um, move on the uh, change management curve, uh, I would do a lot of physical exercise. Like, where does it, like, how is your body feeling? Like, where does it manifest uh, in your body? And, and I would help them to change their phy physiology. Uh, so we would do metaphors and you know, if it's anxiety, it's typically spinning. So which direction is it spinning? Typically from stomach, heart, head, or the other way around. So we would reverse the spin and do this playful, kind of like, whoa, crazy thing, where they were not entirely bought in, especially as I work in the tech industry, they go like, right. what are you doing? Where are you going with that? <laughs> <Where are you laughs> going with that? <laughs> Oftentimes they would go like, mm. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I'd go like, yeah, let's be playful, you know, like whatever strategies you were adopting so far, uh, you could do more of them, yet they were not helping, so let's try something playful, let's try something different, and, and they would be brave, and I'm very proud of them that I would 
follow me there and then and and I love the sparkle in the eye when they go like actually it worked <laughs> <laughs> I love that though because what you're saying is actually goes right to the core of it what you focus on grows so if you're caught in whatever it is in this moment where you don't have a stability or, or, or grounded nature, then to focus people on their physiology and to focus them on actually understanding and naming what it is that's going on immediately brings them out of it. Even if they're a little tentative to start with, it's a, and it actually it's a great technique for anyone who's listening. Whenever you feel that little bit unstable, to recalibrate, to get yourself grounded, is to think about what's really, and feel what's really going on. How do tech people respond to kind of talking about their, their feelings as opposed to what they're thinking? Uh, did that present challenges as well? Because there was a lot of things going on that we could think about during lockdown, right? The news gave us so much information, too much information at times, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, too much information from the news. That resonated quite a lot, actually. Uh, I'd do... Um, <laughs> one of the best strategies that I found, that people found helpful over and over, would be not to read the news before <laughs> they go to bed. Right. Like, you can do it at any time of the day. Just don't do it before you go to bed. Don't do it as a last thing before you sleep because that's what you wake up with in the morning and that's not how you want to program for your next day. Uh, but to your question about people who are very like logical and um, analytical and hierarchical uh, when they don't feel like, yeah, when they don't think they should actually access their feelings, I just do a bit of breathing, pace and lead, you know, pacing at them, listening very, very carefully what's going on, uh, picking up on the feelings, description, the description that they would be giving me, right? They, sometimes they go like, it's really heavy. And they go like, they would touch their shoulders and, 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 and I go like, yeah, heavy, like what? And then we are talking about feelings because they would tell me how the whole world is sitting on their, their shoulders. And so I, I would ask him to offload that world on their shoulders and give it to me just like that over the video con. And they would be like, again, woo-woo. But sometimes it would be so fast. They, they were so keen. Yeah, to, here you go. Yeah. Hey, no. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and so, yeah, I'd be just very playful and... Uh, and, and kind of like creative and and we would be laughing a lot and, and that's a big relief, right? I've uh, listened to one of your uh, episodes actually. It was uh, the lockdown two minute videos that you posted on LinkedIn. Uh, breathe, smile. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it's the, it's the smallest thing that would unlock your access to feelings. And sometimes it would be crazy questions such as what are you focusing that makes it a problem? Yeah, that's yeah. a great question, isn't it? Yeah. Because things don't become a problem until you make them a problem. So, so just thinking like that, um, when you said that before about the smiling and the breathing, I had even my mother uh, call me up and tell me that... Uh, my father had seen the video on LinkedIn and shown her she was using the breathing and smiling technique and she was sharing it with all her friends. So, so she's in like her late 70s. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm never really sure she knows exactly what I do for a living. But I have this mental image of her and her girlfriend like talking on Zoom and she's telling them how to breathe and smile. So they... <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> to make themselves feel better, right? But, but it's what you said. It, it's, it's the simple things. And I wonder, when, when you observe that, you're, you're also a mum. You've got kids at home, homeschooling. Um, how did you balance having kids at home 
you're going through lockdown as well. You're supporting others. That's already three balls that, that you're juggling, <laughs> Misha. I mean, from a personal point of view, forget the coaching bit. Like, like what have you been learning during this period about you? <laughs> I've learned that I have a small house. <laughs> That's not, <laughs> not enough. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> Uh, I've learned that I can do much more than I thought because it entails way more cooking, way more emotions management, even with the kids. Yeah. Uh, my oldest is 10 years old, is uh, diagnosed with Asperger, uh, has all sort of problems with dyslexia, dysgraphia, all sort of frustrations and stuff. And so uh, managing that, managing the dynamics with his uh, young brothers uh, who are almost two and almost three, uh, but you know, the siblings are really young and, and they're yeah. not really respectful of his space and uh, rights and stuff. Yeah, I'm fighting. Sure. Um, I've also learned that I have uh, that I'm super super lucky to live in a in a relationship that's so supportive, um, and and yeah, that that I have the luxury of the hug, right? Right. That yeah. I that I, that my little ones would be hugging me, and and that I have the luxury of uh, human contact. So when I was Going through the lockdown, I think what I had in my mind all the time was that number one, I've discovered I'm an introvert and my husband is an extrovert, whilst the common notion of our friends is that it's the other way around. Right. Uh, but I've always, and back to coaching, when people were, when I was working with people, I was like, for me, it didn't not many things really changed some changed to the better and who am i to complain right because i i felt so privileged that sometimes that was overwhelming i felt so privileged that i felt like i cannot allow myself to feel frustrated or isolated or lonely or you know because i go like what would i complain about right i i have it all so but yeah sometimes it was difficult for me as well uh, we didn't see we we went into strict very strict uh, isolation i needed a babysitter uh, so that i could work at least to to some extent and uh, we wanted to protect her. Uh, she is a mom of my, uh, one of my best friends. So we really wanted to protect her and we didn't want to risk anything. So we were like super, super locked down. We, we did online shopping and everything. And I thought that we were doing fine uh, until we met uh, my sister-in-law and her kids. Uh, again, they were uh, locking themselves down as well, so we felt that they are safe. And we felt like we were on the moon. Like, the mood of everyone was just like, <laughs> we felt like on drugs. It was unbelievable. <laughs> so, uh, I can't say that it didn't affect me. It affected me in a lot of positive ways. But sometimes it was challenging, especially in the context where I felt like I have nothing to complain about. I hear means. you. No, I hear you. I know when, when I was driving my son down from university a week before the lockdown happened, he was like, oh, you know, I can't believe it. we're going to do this lockdown a couple of months, you know, at home. And I, I remember saying to him in the car, you know, I don't know if it's that bad. You, you live in a house, you have a garden, we have a gym, we live in the country, so you can go for a walk, no one's going to see you, we've got the dogs you can go out with all the time, you've got Netflix, you've got PlayStation, you've got Xbox. Really? Really? Is three months so, so bad? And it's not, and, and it's like you say, but there was a period I remember maybe about six or seven weeks in 
I didn't even notice it in myself uh, for maybe a week or so when I suddenly realized actually I was, I was a little off center. I was working quite hard. I was doing lots of webinars and workshops. We were converting all, everything to online sessions and my coaching is all virtual. So the, the lockdown didn't actually change my life particularly except I was no longer on a client site for workshops. But that was maybe one or two days a week. So there was no big difference for me. The, the big difference was that suddenly I was just in this cabin in the back of the garden like 10 hours a day. And I would come into the house at the end of the day and, you know, literally I, I'm exhausted. I'm falling asleep in front of the television. I'm not connecting with the family. And I didn't realize that, you know, I was running as my energy boost, right? And I'm running and, and like one day I'm running like 20 kilometers, like three days running. And it's like, you know, what are you running from? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> stop. <laughs> And it was only noticing that that I realized this lockdown, it was affecting me. And I'm like you, I, although on the surface, I look like an extrovert because of my job. I'm actually innately introverted. I get my energy from sitting under trees very quietly with my dogs. But I recognize that we're all ambiverts, right? We're extrovert and we're introvert. We need both. And living in this office, <laughs> working all the time, was affecting my mental well-being. Not as dramatically as some people. So when I hear you talk about, you know, almost like you can't complain, I hear you, but I also think, but it doesn't mean we should just be silent when we do feel bad. Because what I observed with even the strongest mentally strong people I know, and I, I put myself in this bracket, actually there were moments where it was really tough like it was just tough and it took some like lifting my shoulders up and doing some exercise and right doing a good stretch and a nice breath and following the exercises on those two minute tools just to bring myself forward and I, I wonder you know now that we come out and we're in more of a recovery period there's a whole new kind of energy in the world I'm interested when you talked about when you met with your sister and the kids. I'm wondering if this is what it's gonna be like when organizations start to come back together again. People aren't quite sure how to be, they wanna be close, but they don't wanna be close. Some will wear gloves, some will wear masks. I don't know what, what you're noticing, maybe in Czech it's different to here in the UK, but some people are like wearing masks, a big glasses, you know, big gloves. And other people are walking around like nothing happened the last <laughs> the last three months. Yeah, it's uh, and that's that's uh, in it, it is interesting because it was evolving differently in different countries, different parts of the world. And so, in uh, here where I live in the Czech Republic, many people would not even take it seriously. They would go like, "Nothing's really happening," and. Uh, and, and like in the Czech Republic, like everybody started to wear masks from day one. Uh, we didn't have enough, so we saw, saw, saw them as the world. Mm -hmm. um, and and it, it was unbelievable. It was like big one, one big uniting moment of the whole nation where everyone was by the sewing machine. <laughs> making masks. <laughs> making masks. <laughs> So that was an interesting moment. We have them nice and colorful, everyone. So if you walk by, it's like uh, on a fashion uh, show or something. Uh, but since it started, and Czech Republic was never impacted so much. Uh, maybe because of the masks, we don't know. Maybe because of where we live, how we live. We don't know, right? Nobody knows. There's so many unknowns about this virus that that it's striking. And so here people would go like, yeah, it's all fine. Uh, we would still wear masks in the public transportation, but otherwise it's kind of perceived as it's over. And some people would go like, it almost never happened. And I'm meeting like you, I'm meeting people virtually uh, from New York or from, uh, you know, the heavily impacted countries. And I'm hearing that that someone was sick or that someone died or 
uh, or you know that the, these really big issues where uh, I have many friends in Italy and clients in Italy and what they've been going through is uh, it's a completely different scale and again back to feeling lucky <laughs> for that I live somewhere where I didn't experience it firsthand and feeling so um, I think caring is the word that I'm looking for uh, when I'm speaking with with the clients in Italy or in Paris or in New York and uh, and yeah and then even being kind of like angry when I see that people take it very lightly like denying that it was even an issue and that it's all propaganda it was a lot of interesting dynamics and I think it still is and I think and I and from talking to people it looks like luckily we are going through the recovery stage kind of everywhere or so it seems but there is still a lot that we need to figure out and I think I think there's an element of, I mean, apart from maybe, unfortunately, in the US where the handling has been a little bit different to the rest of the world, mm. where I think they're still very much in the throes of the first wave of the virus. And it's, it seems to be getting worse as we you know, talk today. But everywhere else, when I look across Europe, it seems as though it's kind of flatter, it's down at the bottom. Mm. And the people I talk to now are, like they're finding ways of going back to work uh, and the kids are going back to school or childcare has restarted. So, you know, life is starting to build again. But I think that from a coach's point of view, we have work to do because, you know, people get institutionalized very quickly and three months doesn't feel like a long time. I know it does when you're in it, but in the scale of things, it isn't. But in those three months, I think people have become a little institutionalized, being at home. Yeah. And there's that anxiety again, you know, that we started with. The anxiety then was because all of a sudden this volatile shock hit everybody. Now the anxiety is, going back outside and should I go to the cinema and like my kids going to university university looks really different now Misha right I mean they can't have lectures here in the UK all the lectures are done virtually um my daughter's going to film school and um they can't even go into the studio I don't know how they're meant to make movies when they can't go in the studio the world looks so different. I'm wondering, as a, as a coach, do we need to adjust? Or is it, going back to what you said before, is it just about us being compassionate in how we listen and, and talk to people? Or do we need to change maybe our approaches to kind of take on this new environment that everybody's living in? I don't know the answer to that, by the way. It's a, a genuine question. Yeah, I like coaching is my big passion in life. It's my life purpose. I ever since I found it, I feel fulfilled. And because I seem to have it from God, uh, I seem to know how to help people somehow naturally it comes to me. I think that with great power comes great responsibility. And so I go with, like I study all the time, which uh, my uh, oldest kid uh, quite detests because he goes like, why don't you watch a movie? And I go like, because I don't want to, I want to watch a chorus of <laughs> how to do it better. And, and I'm, and I'm playing with hypnosis and I'm, and I'm learning so many new, approaches on how to how to just sometimes loosen things up i do think that i do need to get better and better still <laughs> and go deeper and deeper still to 
to have just so much more under my toolkit to be able to to efficiently help. And so I don't know if it's COVID related or not. I just think that this isolation was a bit of a catalyst for people because there are there were things that we wouldn't face because we would be busy doing work or uh, going socializing or or we would have so much noise to quieten some of the dark self-talk that was going on in our minds and I do think that it unfolded and I um, I feel sorry for all the people who lost their jobs and who are now, uh, you know, going through the uncertainty of and calculations for how long uh, can I can I do this and how do I change my lifestyle so that I can be without a job for some time and 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 I'm talking about it because. As coaches, I don't know if you experience the same, but I was more busy than before. I have more clients coming to me. Uh, I have clients that are coming to me with deeper problems, with greater challenges, with even more trust in that I would help. And so I feel so much responsibility for yeah for for just learning more and 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 providing support uh and i know that you volunteer a lot and i do the same and i and i would just open uh, my my virtual arms and send virtual hugs to those who live on their own and don't have a physical the luxury of a physical comfort um and so i don't know i don't know if if we need to adjust i think we need to be on the lookout for for being ready to the, for the real stuff even if people start talking about what they are thinking about and stuff when they are coming these days i've noticed a pattern of more cry for help I hear you. I think you're spot on because even the question, how are you, has taken on a whole different meaning now. Yes. And even the first answer, it won't be enough, right? We have to be able to really unpack what how are you means. I remember at the beginning of lockdown here in the UK, everybody was talking about how they're going to learn new things. Yeah, they're going to learn a musical instrument, they're going to read 250 books that they've never read, um, they're going to learn a language. And, and I was sitting here thinking, actually, I just want my business to be intact by the end, and I want to be mentally uh, stable by the end. And if I get through without learning anything new, I'll be, I'll be fine. <laughs> um, but actually, what I've ended up learning is about podcasting, um, but that aside, I think this, the level of compassion needed for coaching, I think is going up. I'm noticing in my conversations, people, yes, they want to talk about work and how they're feeling and what they're thinking about it. But actually, they're, they're wanting to talk about them and, and their family and their situation and their experience. And I'm feeling when I'm in those conversations, actually, it's not even about me having a direction to take them in, in, in the coaching conversation. It's actually just about being a sounding board for them to explore what this whole period has meant to them. It almost feels as though they need to process that what's happened before they can then start thinking about what's my next strategy for upscaling my business. It almost feels like if I ask them this question, I'm doing them a disservice because we need to talk about how are you first. So I'm noticing as a coach that the level of compassion required is much higher than before. Often coaches would come in, it's like, you know, I'd say, so, hey, listen, what's our focus today? 
What have you been thinking about? What's on your radar? And they're like, oh, well, Brad, I wanted to talk about these two things. Oh, which one do you want to start with? Well, let's start with this. And you know, and we're straight in. And 75 minutes later, the alarm goes on my phone and it's like, hey, listen, we've got 10 minutes left. Shall we look to wrap up a bit? What have you got? No, today, how are you? And the conversation just goes from there. Uh, so I'm noticing compassion as a, as a quality of the coach is really coming, coming to the fore. Yeah, and, and um, we've discussed before we've joined, uh, um, I still maintain the coaching community uh, where I'm teaching new aspiring coaches the few techniques here and there every month for two, three hours. And the one thing that we are working on the most is just be there, be there empathetically. Uh, and it's, the, uh, it's also the one thing that is the most struggle for most people. And that is do not project stuff. Right. <laughs> people that you're working with, like whatever they have is theirs. <laughs> Yeah, own it. <laughs> it's easier said than done, Misha, right? It is. Um, it feels as if we're almost coming like full circle. Um, when we start the conversation, you were talking about, you know, when, when it all happened, people were moving through that curve. And actually now we come to this point where actually in your coaching community, We've got to make sure that people don't take their shock, their anxiety, their denial and kind of push it out there. They, they need to kind of <laughs> process it themselves. I wonder, you know, you, you've talked about a couple of things, you know, how people anticipated what they felt, um, helping people move through a process. Uh, you've talked about gratitude and caring, which, which I love to hear because, you know, in, in coaching, I think it's very easy sometimes to forget that actually we're in a very humbling position where people share stuff with us and i think what's happened in this last few months is a lot of stuff's happened to people that they want to share and as coaches we have that very privileged position actually where people engage us to share that stuff so if we're training people <laughs> To not project, that's a really good technique for your guys to learn. I'm putting it out there right now. Officially, do not project. <laughs> Misha's right <laughs> with, with that one. I'll tell you what would be fantastic. If you had to kind of summarize or encapsulate the top three things that you feel are the biggest learnings from this lockdown, how would you kind of pull those those three points together? What would they be for you? Um, it's funny because it totally closed the loop for me uh, based on what you said, that uh, you just need to be there and not project and um and and it's sometimes the projection is to the better because when i discussed my own experience about some i feel so privileged that it's uh, almost like i shouldn't complain and then you presented me with the uh, situation of your son where you go like so you feel low when you have you know your netflix and stuff and, and i was this close to do the same with my son with my 10 years old but he's small so i can't go like full on, full on. I, I really need to breathe first and and figure out what my strategy will be otherwise i can be screwed for days <laughs> yeah right <laughs> And so I just figured that sometimes it's just about sharing the whole, how are you? And you, ha you have your right to be who you are, to feel what you feel. You just don't compare yourself with others because what you see is not necessarily what is 
like what's projected on the outside is not necessarily what's going on in the inside. Right, right. And just the fact that someone seems to be way forward in front of you when it comes to moving through the curve doesn't mean that they are. Right. Also, it doesn't mean that maybe they are but they will start all over with the shock denial and, <laughs> and all over the next day. Um, so this is something that I, that I am taking away. Like you have the right to be who you are. Uh, don't beat yourself for feeling uh, what you feel. Uh, just acknowledge it, be with it. Then breathe in, smile wake up shake it off make a little victory pose to change your physiology and get yourself away from it if you feel so if you don't just then you know well take it take a nap and do it a little later and yeah i think sometimes we need to give ourselves a bit of a leeway uh, and circling back to your learning piano and learning 25 new languages and uh, reading 250 new books. Sometimes we just can just spend time with ourselves and compassion back. So, so much things are closing loops here. Yeah, like right. we can be compassionate to ourselves. And that is, I think, the biggest learning. And my, if I can have a message, then probably this would be my message. <laughs> like people, don't be so tough with yourself and, right. and be compassionate to yourself. Because what we are going through or what seems to hopefully uh, be yes. over slowly uh, is something really unprecedented and it was not normal so if you were not super productive and super at your super best then that's okay too i like that i think that's a beautiful point to, to pause on because that be nice to yourself i think is a a phrase i've used for 20 years as a coach um, I heard myself saying it to somebody just the other day. We were having a little debrief on some resilience questions that we were talking about. And uh, I just looked at her and reminded her that my notes from five years ago mentioned that every time we finished a session, I would say to her, be nice to yourself. And here we were <laughs> five years later, and I was just reminding her, just be, be nice to yourself. And I think we have to do that when we look in the mirror as well and remind ourselves that actually it's okay to take some time off. I'm going now, it's half past three in uh, the afternoon. I'm going to take the rest of the day off after this lovely chat, feeling completely energized from you. Uh, and I'm going to go and walk my dogs uh, for the afternoon um, and not feel bad about it because I'm not answering my emails because they'll be there tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> Won't go away. <laughs> You know what I think we should do, Misha? I think we should come back in the, after the summer and we should have a look at the landscape, see who we've been coaching and see what's happened from this conversation to that one and see if there's anything new we can pick up and share. That would be awesome. I love it. Misha Kozineva, thank you so much for your time and spending time with me and I'll see you again very soon. Thank you. It was lovely. Thanks actually, actually we've got a client we're going to be working on in the next like six weeks or something. So I'll be seeing you very soon. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thanks. So have a lovely walk with your dog. Yeah. And you too. I'll see you soon. I'm going to stop recording. <laughs>